Our next speaker is David Wildman, who will talk to us on Christian Zionism and the Israel lobby. David. Good morning, everyone. I want to express my thanks and appreciation to the jurists and to the tribunal uh, and to everyone here and those who are listening. Uh, it is an honor to be a part of this process to testify here today. I also want to note that we're right before lunch and that fasting is a tradition in many religious uh, faiths, <laughs> but that's not our intention that that be practiced by anyone uh, today. Good. Today, Sunday, the first Sunday of October, is World Communion Sunday, when Christians around the world affirm our unity as followers of Jesus, despite centuries of bitter and often violent divisions. 11 years ago in 2001, on October 7th, the first Sunday, that was also World Communion Sunday, a so-called Christian nation began bombing and invading a Muslim nation, Afghanistan, ostensibly to declare that the killing of civilians for political purposes is so reprehensible and should be stopped. Now, 11 years later, the U.S. war in Afghanistan is the longest war in U.S. history, and the killing of civilians continues in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Palestine, in Pakistan, in Somalia, in Yemen, in Libya, and the list goes on. Why start my analysis of Christian Zionism and the Israel lobby with such a reflection? Because the strongest base of support for war in Afghanistan, both then and now, is among Christian Zionists. And I also want to recall what W.E.B. Du Bois, the great African-American scholar, said roughly 100 years ago that Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in the nation. The United States, that is. It still is. And so I'm glad to be here to affirm the unity of people committed to equal rights for all people on the planet, all of God's children. I speak today as a Christian about Christian Zionism and its role within the wider Israel lobby. And I speak as a human rights advocate against the ways that faith is repeatedly misused to provide a theological justification, economic funding, and political support for systemic, long-standing, and ongoing dispossession and discrimination against the Palestinian people. So let me start with a little definition of Christian Zionism, the Israel lobby, and then I want to look at some of the key aspects of how they are complicit in violations. Christian Zionists believe, as a belief first developed in the 1840s in English-speaking areas of Britain and the United States, and believe that the return of Jews to Palestine and the establishment of a Jewish state would be key signs for the second coming of Christ, for the final battle of Armageddon and the end of the world. Movies weren't being made at that time, but they are now. Um, it was a very kind of pessimistic sense, but one that Christians would prevail in that. I want to touch on just uh, a couple of key points in the Christian Zionist chronology that I think are helpful for our discussions and deliberations today. Uh, there was a fellow named Darby in the 1840s who first kind of outlined this schema and secret knowledge of reading the Bible in a certain way a Methodist pastor named Blackstone in the 1880s began taking these beliefs and lobbying the US government to support Jews emigrating to Palestine. You may have heard of the Schofield Bible. Schofield was a former Confederate and a fraud. 
he popularized Christian Zionism in the notes that he put in his Bible. Lord Balfour, in Britain, was influenced heavily by Christian Zionist thinking. So key dates for Christian Zionists are 1948, the establishment of the State of Israel. 1967, the expansion of Israeli control over the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. A third key component is in 1977, the election of Menachem Begin and the Likud party. Christian Zionists for many years were anti-communist. And so now that there was not the labor government but a Likud government, there were some openings and belief that this too might be another sign in God's divine plan that only they knew about. President Carter and the quote unquote giving back of Sinai in the accords that you heard uh, Ch uh, Professor Chomsky talk about was seen as a betrayal of their theology. And so in the late 70s, the Christian Coalition and many other Christian Zionist organizations began uh, forging alliances with the broader religious right. Uh, you may remember books like The Late Great Planet Earth. Uh, the Left Behind series is the latest version of that. Um, someone else might be writing Behind the Left as another series. Um, <laughs> what's interesting is that there was always an enemy. Schofield's Bible pointed to Tsarist Russia as the Antichrist. It was very easy then for the Tsarist Russia to become the Soviet Union and anti-communism. Today, the great en enemy is Islam. In that late 70s, there was this shift from an apolitical, more spiritual expression of Christian Zionism to a mobilized, imperialist political program with increasing economic power. The shift from religious beliefs to actions is what violates human rights and international law, not the beliefs of a personal religion. Now, to be clear, I want to make it absolutely certain that the vast majority of Christians in the world of all sorts of stripes reject Christian Zionist teachings as false and a misreading of the Bible. So just to be clear, uh, indeed, uh, you heard the list of UN uh, resolutions that were vetoed and violated, the list of Jesus' teachings that are violated repeatedly or ignored by Christian Zionists is perhaps as long. Think of love your enemy, to be peacemakers, uh, to bring justice. Now the Israel lobby. Christian Zionists are one part of that, and they relate closely in different ways to different aspects. The military-industrial congressional complex, which is how President Eisenhower initially drafted it in the 50s, um, continues to be a significant portion of the Israel lobby. A militarized and highly volatile Middle East is a blessing to arms sales. And in fact, last year, Arms sales around the world soared for the U.S. that now accounts for close to three quarters of world arms sales. There's a love triangle of money. I mean, we heard about the faithful triangle. There's a love triangle of money, arms, and political power. Corporations that are profiting from aspects of the settlements and occupation. APAC and major Jewish and pro-Israel organizations. And I also want to speak today about the silence and complicity of many so-called liberal entities, colleges, churches, unions, and media. In their silence, they too are part of the Israel lobby. So what are the key aspects of Christian Zionism? Uh, there are seven that I want to share with you today that contribute to US violations. The first is a dualistic theology, good versus evil good guys who can do no wrong versus bad guys who have no civilians or non-combatants on their side. There's no civilians in Gaza, for instance. It's a US settler and colonizing theology of Christian cowboys versus, excuse me, heathen Indians. Uh, but the racist metaphors go on and on. It is an apartheid-type theology. In South Africa, the church is gathered to condemn that kind of theology and its complicity with apartheid. It's time for churches now to speak out and condemn that in relation to the Israel lobby and Christian Zionists. Second, a religious apology for the US-Israeli military expansion as being somehow part of God's plan. There are close ties with a number of Christian Zionist organizations in the religious right with the US military. 
many of the headquarters of groups like focus on the family and others are in colorado springs the same place as the headquarters for the u s air force there are many examples of this but i just want to point to that of the link that somehow military action by the u s and israel is part of god's unfolding plan third truth is based on belief not on facts uh, this is a really important one so facts don't actually matter unless they fit the belief system of Christian Zionists. The close ties with talk radio and Fox News style media, uh, political events and wars is unfolding of somehow a cosmic divine struggle between good and evil. Fourth, is a theological apology for US empire and corporate power. It's the gospel of wealth, or the, these days we would say the 1%, and that how can we be a part of that? Uh, and join in. There are close ties with a variety of corporate aspects of the Israel lobby here. Um, consider the donations of Christian Zionists that exceed that of any other group to the Israeli settlers and especially the most extreme uh, expansionist uh, Israelis within the settlement movement. Now there are three places in the world and I don't have time to go into this but I do want to just note this that a settler colonizing theology has been used so extensively uh, to justify violence and domination. The United States is certainly one, and the displacement and dispossession of many indigenous peoples. S apartheid South Africa was the second, and the third is Israel. The fifth point is the need for an enemy. It was communists, it was czarist Russia, which was mostly orthodox, Christians, and so therefore not really Christians in the minds of evangelical conservative Christian Zionists. Now the enemy is Islam. And I want to be clear that in Christian Zionist teaching of this kind, Jews are not to be converted, but are as Jews to return and establish state power in Israel, while Muslims are open to conversion. With the war in Afghanistan, the war on terror, and the invasion of Iraq, Many Christian Zionists saw the Muslim world as being open to a Christian crusade like nothing that had happened in the last 1,000 years. It's beyond Islamophobia. It is a crusade and it needs to be challenged. And in this process, it also renders invisible Palestinian Christians. That's why I think the Kairos Palestine document that was issued in December of 2009 is such a threat to Christian Zionists and the Israeli lobby, Israel lobby. So now if you combine these five different components, a dualistic theology, an apology for military action, truth is based on belief, not facts, an apology for corporate power in the US empire, and that the new enemy is Islam, any groups and organizations that stand for human rights, that advocate nonviolent transformation and identifying and naming of international law must be opposed. They are enemies. You're either with us or with the terrorists. Remember that kind of duality. And any allies, that is the rest of the Israel lobby, are partners in God's plan of world dominion. So you've got, one, you've got to be on one side or the other. Now I want the seventh part, and the most significant part in some ways, is the right-wing populism and kind of personalist piety of your everyday Christian Zionists, many of whom, most of whom are white in the United States and English-speaking worlds, though there are manifestations of Christian Zionism in Korea and in other places around the world too. But I'm, for the moment, talking about uh, the dynamic here in the US. Um, they are the largest mass base of support for the agenda of the Israel lobby and the imperial lobby of the US for militarized corporate power and domination of resources around the world. Now, a number of years ago, I was meeting with the Reverend Naim Atik, uh, who is the founder of Sabil, a Palestine Ecumenical Liberation Center in Jerusalem. He's a Palestinian Christian, and we were having a discussion here in New York on Christian Zionism and how could churches challenge that. I left, I was very empowered by the speech and I raced to the airport because I had a 
meeting in Seattle I had to get to that night. I was the last person on the plane. And I sat down and thankfully, you know, this is in religious terms, God is good, the only empty seat was the one between me and the fellow sitting by the window. I then looked over and he shared with me that he had been in New York for two weeks evangelizing in Harlem as a white fellow. And on the cap of his baseball cap was a minority. I said, oh my God, this guy is a Christian Zionist. <laughs> my Palestinian sisters and brothers will not let me get the much needed sleep that I desired at that moment. <laughs> Seven hours later, after trading scriptures and probably driving all of our seatmates around us crazy, <laughs> we parted at the baggage claim and he agreed that he would pray for Palestinians. He was someone who had been involved with substance abuse, alcohol, in abusive relationship, and had found Jesus that transformed his life. He found Jesus at a church that espoused Christian Zionism. I share this story to say we need to reach the people and develop relationships with them that break through this equation of their own personal transformation with the colonizing ideology of Christian Zionism and the religious right. That's a challenge for us today. Two other brief areas I want to touch on, I know my time is running out, uh, is there's an incredible emancipatory power of biblical e Israel, of the exodus and prophets that have been used and drawn on in African American, Latino communities uh, that are more evangelical in their theology than liberal uh, Christianity, that are being co-opted by the Israel lobby as expressions of Christian Zionism. And I think we need to challenge that. Uh, and do some hard work in communities of developing relationships that biblical is, Israel is not equal to the modern state of Israel. That criticism of the Israeli government is not anti-Semitism. There is curriculum in the US that the Israel lobby is sharing specifically for African Americans, for Native Americans and others on their close ties with Israel. This is a part of the process that needs to be challenged as well. Finally, the wider complicity of so-called liberal Christians, you can pick your other name, mainline, sideline, whatever. Um, the complicity of Christians in the churches with the Israel lobby through Jewish Christian dialogue that for decades has blocked Christian prophetic action condemning human rights violations in the Middle East. Now in this, it's a little bit akin to, I would just urge you to read Martin Luther King's um, letter from the Birmingham jail. But I'd also urge you to read the white liberal clergy's letter to King that sparked him to take his spare time to write a letter back. Um, thankfully, there's not remembered, but their letter reads like the arguments now against divestment, against nonviolent action, against <clears throat> groups like the Christian peacemaker teams and other uh, international solidarity movement and other accompaniers that are on the ground. Um, saying we can't, we, need, we, have, we, we need to talk with one another. Always be wary when folks only have talking as their strategy and they're still in power. It's also like the white liberals that churches finally condemned for their complicity with South African apartheid that said it just was something that needed to be reformed a little bit. Um, so that now what's happened in all too many liberal churches and colleges and unions, and I was only asked to address the churches um, within the Israel lobby, but opposing nonviolent moral actions of BDS offers like instead this paternalistic, colonial, positive investment, economic development, that you know Palestinians just don't have the capacity, they don't know, with no mention, and in fact in intention to deny the ways in which Palestinian infrastructure has been systematically destroyed. So finally, in challenging Christian Zionism in the Israel lobby, I would hope our goal is to decolonize Christian theology, and I'll leave to other faiths the decolonization of other respective faiths through intentional and committed long-term anti-racist activity. Second, to demilitarize their political program. Military might is never 
God's intent of harming others. So do no harm. And here we might take it uh, as a first step for challenging the Israel lobby, the example of the US Department of Agriculture. For too long, if you sell weapons and they get used, you need to sell more weapons. The Department of Agriculture has an approach with subsidies that if you, you get the subsidy if you don't produce the product. I think we could break the love triangle of the Israel lobby and Congress and military contractors if we just said, look, we'll give the companies money only if they don't make any weapons. All right, I don't have time to elaborate on that, but I think this is something as, uh, as, a, as a, a remedy that we might uh, work on. Um, second is invite Christian Zionists, like this fellow that I was forced to engage with over in my uh, long airplane ride, to Palestine. Uh, the Bethlehem Bible College has done two Christ at the Checkpoint conferences that invited Christian Zionists, Messianic Jews, many evangelical Christians, and said, come develop relationships, break bread with Palestinians, Christian and Muslim, and then go back and see what's wrong with your theology. We've got to challenge tax-exempt donations like, uh, that go to settlements. That's another part of breaking the violations and remedying the violations of the lobby in Christian Zionism, like the Norwegian uh, Fund recently did, but also like the United Methodist uh, church adopted in May was a call to challenge and investigate uh, funds. Finally, we need nonviolent moral actions of boycott and divestment. Actions recommended by Palestinian Christians in Kairos, Palestine. Uh, the United Methodist Church that adopted a boycott of settlement products and companies operating the settlements, uh, the Presbyterians, the United Church of Canada, and the Friends Fiduciary Committee that voted to divest from HP, uh, Veolia, and Caterpillar. And we also have to challenge any monolithic reading of the Israel lobby and its power as another form of dualistic thinking. There's a cluster of forces, and I hope I was able to portray that, that make up the Israel lobby. They're by no means monolithic, and they are quite threatened at the moment by the power of nonviolent people's action that's growing around the world. Thank you. Thank you, David, very much. I think this is an area that few of us factor in when we're dealing with the subject of Israel and Palestine. Uh, I wonder if there are people on the jury who would like to uh, comment or question Marit. Thank you very much for your presentation. The uh, prophet Muhammad, peace be with him, was a prophet of peace and nonviolence. Jesus was a prophet of peace and nonviolence. At the heart of the Christian faith today, there is a lie. And the lie is that there's such a thing as a just war and that Christians and others can kill each other. The church hierarchy, the Christian church hierarchy, has never dealt with this lie. So this lie perpetuates itself in places like Northern Ireland and our conflict with the armed struggle. We're fighting a just war. Jesus blesses just wars. This lie lies in the heart of American Christians who are arguing the just war. America's right to go to war, be it Iraq, Iran, Israel, Palestine, wherever. We're right. Do you see any hope within the American Christian leadership or the world Christian leadership or the laity where the just war theory will be acknowledged as a phony piece of morality? and where a true theology of love your enemy and love each other can evolve in order to help the human family move into new relationships? That's my first question. The movement between all the faith groups and none, in the Islam faith, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Christians, coming together to 
deal with issues like human rights, um, the environment crisis, the poverty, the real enemies of the human family? Do you see, and at what point is this movement, because I know it's there, part of it, but at what point is this movement able to make its voice heard so that we change the power structures at the top and end the occupation of Palestine and the militarization of our world? Thank you. Um, on the first part about any hope in the Christian um, community about ending and rejecting a just war, well, hope biblically is what has no empirical evidence uh, in front of you. So I have lots of hope, uh, let me say, first of all. Um, second, that the just war theory only came into Christian teachings after an emperor started going to church. So there may be a problem here um, that is a, has a different kind of remedy in terms of when the church has aligned itself with power, then just war theory, um, greed, is not nice. Uh, so you confuse it and mystify it with a theological rationale. And in the same way, the expansion of territory at the expense of others. Uh, so what I would say is there are movements. I think the Kairos Palestine document is a, not only a message to Palestinian Christians and not only a message to the wider Christian community, but really a message to the world about challenging finally this link of violence with any faith uh, of doing harm against other human beings. On the second point, on the interfaith movement, you know, in religious terms, I think the second great commandment for Christians is to love our neighbor. And we just have disputes over exactly who our neighbor is. Uh, we have borders, uh, like the Rio Grande, uh, that says, well, some neighbors are on one side of this, and other neighbors are not neighbors if they're on the other side. Uh, that's, in Palestine today, it's struggling over neighbors as the barrier to interfaith work. So when we say that every sister and brother, and especially ones in harm's way, that are being discriminated against, are the people we need to stand with, first and foremost, then there will be much stronger movement in an interfaith way. Uh, and the US campaign to end Israeli occupation is something that I find is one of the most interfaith expressions here in the United States, of folks working together, because human rights are not to be negotiated, they're to be enforced. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else? Is there another? Um, I would like to say something, if I may. Please. Um, I would just like to point out that oftentimes people make um, controversial, supportive of the status quo, um, personal decisions that also benefit them um, in the pocketbook. And so there's this nice uh, convergence, I guess is the word, between taking a, pos a public position and then being able to sustain oneself. Because we know the fate that is visited upon people who take a courageous position in opposition to power and what happens to them. Now, there's one, I'm not really, uh, even though I was, you know, baptized a Catholic and all of that. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> but just as an observer, John Hagee is one of the most prominent Christian Zionist, and John Hagee is extremely wealthy. He reaps a reward, unlike people who give, like the sisters on this panel, who give and give and give because they want to make their community better, and they end up sacrificing. John Hagee has a particular position and he has been rewarded. So could you talk to me about the impact of personal reward on public position? Thank you, and as a full disclaimer, let me say I'm not receiving any honorarium for, uh, 
this is part of my work for the church. Um, I think there's an element of self-fulfilling prophecy that you know, someone like Hagee can, not looking at the backdoor deals and alliances, turn around and say, you see, God must be a Christian Zionist. Look at me. And you could be too. It's a kind of Amway strategy. Or pyr I mean, pyramids were not just in Egypt. Uh, they are strategies used by leaders, religious and secular, to advance their own agenda. And I think that anytime someone's willing to compromise on one's values, or personal advancement um, is very important. We need to name and shame that. Thank you so much. Um, and I think now we are about to go to have lunch. Enjoy it. We're not about to go to have lunch. Don't enjoy it. Reach out. Uh, I must tell you something because this man is in charge of human rights and. Uh, Racial anti-racial anti discrimination in the Methodist Church, and we we meet him. We meet him when we found we make the first visit to the states in February last February, and he was so kind to receive us, and he offered, in the name of the Methodist Church, the place where Monday we will have our press conference for the jury and it's in front of the UN. So that is a very symbolic uh, contribution of the Methodist Church, and I will thank you very much for this contribution. So you can say... <laughs> thank you.